Alright, um, thank you. We will go through the biggest points here anyway. Yeah, that should work out pretty well. Okay. Then. And welcome you to uh, the second session of scientific programming in Python, um, which is basically introduction part two. Um, I'm going to talk about um, Git and like the rest of the installation process stuff, like if something didn't work out, and the general um, introduction to, to working with the command line or shell, and then Git, and then Rüdiger is going to explain the homework system and how the works should be then you apply for that. Okay, first of all, I updated uh, the installation instruction, so I installed um, a Windows virtual machine and it works on my clean Windows 10 virtual machine now with the Windows instructions. Yes, it got a bit longer, um, but I am like this, it should work. So what did I update? First of all, for some, um, you had permission programs when trying to install this, uh, when trying to install the environment it worked for me after updating Conda. So once you've installed Conda, you simply run Conda update Conda. And then it, re it, it worked at least for me. Um, if it still doesn't work for you, come to me. We will try to figure something out. But hopefully it works after updating Conda. Um, and then what also sometimes didn't work was the Jupyter Lab extension um, running that. Uh, that is because Windows sometimes, the Windows doesn't recognize the simple Jupyter space something command. It, it should work if you go for Jupyter hyphen lab extension because Windows just doesn't know the standalone command Jupyter sometimes and all Jupyter space something commands don't work. For example, also Jupyter space lab doesn't work. Um, in that case, Jupyter hyphen lab or Jupyter hyphen lab extension something should work. So, like I said, these are the instructions which work on my fresh Windows 10 virtual machine. If it still doesn't work for you, we will figure something out. And yeah, like I said, so this here is um, the important thing, adding Anaconda to your path, such that you can access it from your command line. If you didn't do that, I'm gonna show how to do that manually uh, also. Yeah, you want to check out, uh, you want to commit Unix style in any way, and you also want to add Git to your path. And then afterwards, um, where Python should return something which is inside the Conda, where Conda returns something and where Git returns something. So that means you now have Anaconda and Python inside Anaconda, you have Git and yeah, you have Python inside Anaconda. Okay, um, then, so before everything we do, we want to first activate our, oh shit, it's not activate scientific Python, but scientific programming. Um, oops. Um, yeah, never mind, I will change that later. So you, first, you always want to activate the environment, scientific programming, and once you do that, your shell should indicate that um, you're inside this environment. To deactivate it again, one corner deactivate, and everything, for, if you didn't, if you're not in the environment, most of the commands won't work and Python won't find the packages because the packages are only inside this environment, so you need to activate this environment every time you work on the exercises. And once you activated it, you can run Jupyter Lab by executing Jupyter Lab and then the directory of where you want to start Jupyter Lab, um, which if you navigate it to the correct directory up front is simply Jupyter Lab dot because dot means current folder. Yes. Um, so when I'm in, when I'm not inside the environment, it tells me base, and once I activate, uh, activate the programming, they said something Python. It tells me by um, showing the scientific programming. It should also do that on Windows. You have Ubuntu, but then it should also show that definitely. Windows it does that too. <coughs> um, well, if it doesn't, then something in the installation process was probably wrong. So, 
if you forgot the name of your environment, there's always conda info, conda info, <coughs> and, and if the environment is there, so I have a couple more environments, but if the environment is listed there, then this is what you can um, activate, and once it is activated, it should indicate in your shell. You can also, like, maybe your shell doesn't indicate it, but then you should see that if you run conda list, which lists you all packages inside the current environment, so if I run conda list here, or rather I probably have some, so if I run conda list in my scientific programming environment, it shows me a bunch of packages, for example, Jupyter, and I don't know, pandas and numpy and all the stuff which is listed there. And if I conda deactivate, deactivate, um, and run conda list again, it shows me obviously less packages. So if you have some packages inside after activating the environment, then um, if you have more packages after activating the environment than you had before, um, then that also means that you're inside the environment. Um, or I mean, like what you can also do is just run which Python, and then you should see the path to which oh. uh, <coughs> the interpreter points to. And if this path contains the name of your environment, like here, and slash scientific Python, and you are in the scientific Python environment. And if not, then you are somewhere else. It does contain it. Okay, then it's probably okay, but I don't know. Some shells shell. don't indicate it sometimes. But so if I if I run a new shell, interestingly, um, could it be I recently installed uh, an anaconda and I deactivated this base thing? Okay, yeah. Then it probably also just base just shows you the base environment. So if you don't show the base environment, it probably won't show any environment. Okay. But yeah, it should be fine if your Python now points to the anaconda Python. Okay, we will have the hands-on thingy after the session anyway, so that you can come to us with all your problems. Okay, um, should work for most of you. Like I said, if it doesn't, um, I will explain a bit more after Git, and then I will, uh, then we just gonna um, have one-on-one -on -one anyway. Okay, so Git, and you didn't also, you didn't only install Conda, you also installed Git. What is Git? Um, Git is a version control system, and a version control system, uh, the purpose of a version control system is that you know that you have, that you can change, uh, track changes of files over time. So before I got to know version control systems, um, and when I had my first programming projects, I just made some directory, okay, this is the state at 0.1, and then once I had some new milestone in a sense, I made a new directory 0.2, 0.3, and this is version hell. Then you have um, some final, 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 oh no, something went wrong, final, and then you have many, many directories, and this is just completely unnecessary. This is, um, you have to store every file, like obviously for every single time you, you have it, and Git is just the smarter version of doing exactly this, of doing exactly this, because Git um, stores only the difference of differences of files, and such that you can go back to any old version and you can compare new versions to old versions, you can have multiple versions parallel, you can work simultaneously on projects, and Git is just the way better um, versioning system than making new files again and again. So version control systems are commonly used for programming, pro for programming projects, but can be useful for any other kind of projects. For example, I have a Git repository for my to-do lists. As long as they are text-based files, it's perfect because I can just make a commit every time I did something and then never lose my old to-dos, like my lists stay short, but Git knows like the old to-dos. I have a Git repository for my um, configuration for my laptop and so on, so Git is useful for many things, but for programming projects where you simply have, where you really have important, ver where versioning is important, Git is really useful. Okay, so why version control? Because where well, this is um, what would happen if you wouldn't have version control, you would have many folders and you would use completely lose um, yeah, any idea of what's going on there. And version control systems work far better because well, they track and lock changes in your files together with the author, a timestamp, and description. So whenever you commit something, you save the state of your code right now, and it saves the author, which is you, or other authors if you work with multiple people, and the timestamp of when you did it, and the description which you have to manually provide. And with Git, you can restore old versions at any point in time. You can have multiple versions in parallel. If you're working on multiple features of the same project in parallel, you can analyze your code and compare it with the old versions, and you can collaborate and code with other people doing the same thing. 
Okay, the most important thing about Git, like the, yeah, is a commit. Um, a commit is a snapshot of your whole project at a certain time. So if you made something important or before you make some breaking changes, you always want to commit. Um, a commit then saves its predecessor. So like I said, it saves the entire project at a certain time. And for that, it references what the version before was. It, which is its predecessor, the changes in the files, which is then the data from the predecessor. Like I said, did, Git doesn't um, change the entire files, but only the differences in your files, which is uh, way better, because sometimes you don't change all files, obviously. And like I said, it saves author time and commit message. Um, a Git commit is identified by a hash. Normally, it's some hexadecimal string of like, I don't know, 20, 20 signs length. Um, we will call them C1, C2 from now on, um, because it makes it easier to explain them. Okay, so if we have uh, a project in Git, this is what it may look like. So we have our first initial commit, once we initialize our Git repository. It's simply an empty directory, oops, sorry, with nothing in there. And then imagine we added some readme file and we had directory code with two files in, code with two files in there. This would, and then we commit it again, this would be a new commit. So this commit now will change um, its predecessor, which is C1, and the changes in all these codes, and whatever you provide as commit method, and all that time. And then imagine we made a, we changed some files, so we didn't change the readme, but we renamed code into source, and we renamed this test in data, into data, and we want to commit that again, then we make a new commit, and this new commit then con contains the new files, and also the indication that it's um, a predecessor of this. And then, so one commit in Git is a snapshot of the whole project of a certain, at a certain time. <laughs> Next thing is the repository. The repository is simply where the sum of all commits, so the entire version database. A Git repository is first commit, second commit, third commit, fourth commit. Uh, so it contains all commits, and it's saved in a hidden folder of your project directory called dot .git. Dot .files and Unix systems are um, hidden in any way. So this is where your entire Git repository lies inside your project. So Git saves one directory, which is then your project directory, and that's the repository in this .git file. So if you have your working directory with some files, as soon as you hit the command git commit, it will put all these stage files, I will explain what stage files are in a second, and put the, make a new commit out of them, and add that to the version database. Okay. Um, this is why, in case of a fire, always git commit everything, git push onto the server, and then you can get yourself out. Um, but yeah, git is git saves your code, so um, it's the most important thing to do before you leave the building. Okay, so like I said, um, git, uh, when, you, when you do a commit, it puts all stage files into a new commit, and there are um, several file statuses which git sees. So, first of all, if you initialize a git, Let's start from bottom to top. If you initialize a new Git repository um, for a certain directory, first of all, all files will be untracked. Untracked files, Git knows they're there, but Git won't do anything. With it. If you commit them, nothing is, like if you Git commit, nothing is gonna happen because they are not tracked by Git. Um, once you add them, they are staged, like I said. So you Git add them, then they are staged, and they will be committed. Once you committed them, they will be unmodified. So there is a commit with them, and the file is still registered in JIT, but equal to the last commit. And then if you change these files, um, they're going to be modified, which means the file is registered for Git and was changed. And then you have to add them again, such that they will be committed with the next commit. What does that mean? So imagine we have some, like I said, we initialize a Git repository in a um, in a directory with a bunch of files. And then once we add a file, git add is the command for that, it's gonna be staged. Staged means the next time we commit, it's gonna be, well, it's gonna be committed and git makes a snapshot from it. So once we commit it, git makes a new commit and the file we just uh, committed is now unmodified because it's equal to the last version in the repository because we just committed. So this would be an unmodified file afterwards. And um, then if we edit the file, it will be modified because well, there is one commit here um, and the file now differs obviously because we edited it and it's a modified one. 
and we have to add this modified file again such that it becomes staged, such that with the next commit, um, we will be able to, so it makes a snapshot of from the file. Um, alternatively to that, there's the command git commit minus a, which um, simply commits all modified files. So it basically adds all modified files, all files with has a state is modified, makes a commit, and yeah, then obviously all the modified files are added, committed, and because they're also committed, they come back to the unmodified, unmodified state. Okay, so where are the commit mates here? Well, here, so we have, we added the file, which is in our file system, so this is the first commit, and we made a new commit here, so this would be where our two commits are. Okay, and how can you figure out the status of a file? Um, well, the command is the status, and at least for me, git status is literally every other command. So I make something, I want git status, I make something, I want git status. And git status, like I said, will tell you which of these um, statuses your files have. So changes to be committed are all the stages one, are all the staged ones. So the next time I run git commit, it's gonna commit these two files um, to my new commit. Um, then there's uh, changes not staged for commit. So these are the modified ones. So this one here is modified, but won't be committed with the next commit. Um, listing all the unmodified files would be not necessary because well, it doesn't change anything, but Git also lists the untracked files, which are completely, which are in the same directory, but Git doesn't care about them yet because we didn't add them yet. Okay, so what would be a normal Git workflow? Well, first of all, you have your file system and then you want to, well, then you change, you work on some files, you add the files, so, so no, first of all, we work on some files, so imagine we change these four files, we have to add them such that they're staged, and imagine now we didn't want to add our nodes in this commit, such that we only added these three files, and then we committed, well, then these three files obviously not changed anymore because they are, we made a second commit, and now the, the files are the way they are in the second commit, and however, we didn't add our nodes, so our nodes are still changed because this, um, because in this commit, um, it, it, we didn't add them, so it takes the one from the previous commit, which are changed in comparison to the previous commit. To also add our nodes, we would have to stage them again and then commit again, such that now the nodes are also unchanged for Git, and we have a third commit where we changed one file. Everything you don't add, Git doesn't care about. Git is it's, uh, still changed. Okay if that makes sense. Good. And then um, you probably all heard about GitHub. Um, well, GitHub is not Git. Git works perfect fine, perfectly fine without GitHub. And like I said, Git is for your local system such that you can version all your, you have versions of all your files. And GitHub itself is only a server where, where you can upload your Git repositories. So GitHub is a website providing a service to all your projects. And GitHub also has a nice web interface, easy to access them, collaborate with others. And then GitHub adds many additional features, mainly for collaborating with pull requests, such that you don't simply overwrite code by pushing onto existing repositories, but have to ask somebody to pull your new code. And you can, um, uh, you have to have code reviews, you can, um, make them have code reviews, for example, such that people don't just add new code, but someone has to look over it. Git has, Git ha GitHub has issues um, for big open source projects that people can demand features or um, tell about, uh, say something about bugs. Git has, GitHub has wikis and so on and so on. So, but like I said, GitHub itself is only external storage plus a nice user interface for big projects and Git works perfectly fine without GitHub. If you want to collaborate on uh, multiple computers, however, you do need something like GitHub or something else like GitLab or um, Bitbucket, such that you can make, such that you can uh, work with multiple people on the same project. However, you need to manually synchronize your local directory with GitHub. If you commit something, it's only committed on your computer, and you have to push it to GitHub um, before it's on there. And this is now the workflow of distributed version control system. So imagine. Computer B is oops, computer B is um, the GitHub server. So and computer A is you. So imagine you made some commits. So you created some files and you made a commit of them. You push them to GitHub. 
And now GitHub also contains your commit C1. So again, the numbers one, two, three, four, five uh, simply stand for some random string which is detached. <coughs> so you make some commit, you pushed it to Git. And now somebody else um, pulled your, um, your commit and worked on it. And in the same time, you also uh, continue working on projects. So you pushed your first version to GitHub. And then you made a new commit and a new commit. And simultaneously, somebody else pulled your C1 and also made a new commit and then pushed that again, such that now um, the uh, current version on GitHub would be C4 because somebody else uh, made C4. Before they pushed that, Susie, for example, also pulled your C1 and also worked on the project and made a new commit, C5. And then in between, this other person also made a new commit um, based on, on their C4, C6, and also committed that. So now, um, the newest version on GitHub would be C6, the newest version Susie had would be C5, and the newest version you have would be C3, but Susie's version and your version um, branch from C1, such that um, there are differences here which you don't have, and differences you have which are not on GitHub. Which is, which um, explains the workflow of working with distributed version control system. That is, that you always have to pull before you push. So if there are changes on the remote computer on GitHub, GitHub will not allow you to simply add your changes too, because that wouldn't make any sense, because you didn't incorporate the newest version from Git, from GitHub. So what you have to do first, you have to first pull what's, what is changed on GitHub, such that you have to see six, and then you have to manually merge I mean, depending, sometimes they can merge automatically, but if there are some breaking changes, um, you have to manually look which features from each um, commit you want to have. And then you have to manually merge, merge your version, C3, with the version from GitHub, C6, and then you would have to make a new commit, let's call it C3, C7, and then the C7 you could push to GitHub, such that the newest one would be here, C7, which incorporates the changes from C6 and your C3. Now, if Susie wants to incorporate her changes um, from C5, Susie would have to pull again um, and merge her C5 with the C7 now on GitHub, such that she can then make a new commit C8 and then push that to GitHub such that the newest version would be C8. What do I want to tell you with this? Always pull before you push and in the homework, we're gonna um, distribute the homework with GitHub and if we made changes and push them on GitHub, um, because where we had something wrong in the homework and we need to fix that, then you can't simply push your solution to the homework, but you first have to pull from GitHub um, before you can push. We will explain that um, once that happens, and it will most likely happen. It happened a few times last year. Um, but don't be scared if you can't push. Just you have to pull, and then hopefully it automatically merges. Most of the times it actually does, especially in smaller things. Um, and then you can push your own changes. Okay. Um, if you didn't understand all this, it's not important because I'm going to demonstrate it now anyway. Okay. <laughs> um, to demonstrate, I wanted to start with um, the shell anyway now. So, um, so everything from Git, everything you do in Git, you do from the terminal. Um, it differs a bit from Windows to Unix-like systems. I'm going to first start with the um, Linux one, and then I will hopefully stay on the Windows one. Okay, so first of all, what is a shell? Well, um, a shell is simply supposed to be like the outer layer of your operating system, um, and a shell runs commands on behalf of the users. So, Basically, your desktop is also shell. Everything where you can select files and work on, uh, where you can select programs and start these programs is a shell. And while there are obviously graphical ones like your desktop, um, where most of the magic actually happens is on the command line. So, um, yeah, we have this thing here. I think Linux users should know how to open the shell in Linux. So I have simply, I can simply, uh, I can simply run my terminal here from uh, KDE. From Windows, it's the command line. So Windows, the Windows shell works a bit different than uh, the Linux one. 
Um, it doesn't have all the commands, but it works just fine too. So on Windows, I simply hit the Windows key, hit CMD, and then the command prompt is my shell. Um, <coughs> Windows most of the time suggests you PowerShell by now, um, but at least for me, some Conda commands didn't work from the PowerShell, which is why I simply fall back to the command prompt in Windows, and it should work out just fine. I will explain what the difference between these okay. two is. So the Anaconda prompt simply um, has some commands with the command prompt doesn't if you didn't add them, um, but you can manually add them and I will explain that too. Okay, so this here is now the Windows shell and like how do we get around here? Well, I am, I am in some folder and uh, I am in some directory and this directory is C users user, which is my home directory in Windows. The home directory um, on Unix-like systems is simply indicated by this tilde sign. I can also ask Linux um, what directory this is, and this is my home directory slash home slash quiz. On Windows, it's C slash users slash something. Okay, I can um, ask, well, what, uh, what's in my directory. So this is the same um, as the ls command in Unix-like systems. And it will simply tell you the directories and files which are in this folder. And I navigate around by changing directory, cd. I can change directory to, for example, uh, there's some, um, there's a directory called music in here, and then uh, where there are no files in the music directory. And if I want to go into the super folder, the command for that is dot dot. So if I change directory to dot dot, I change directory to my super folder. Okay, like I said, I can list my directory with the dir command. Um, I can make, uh, for example, a new directory by using the command mkdir, make directory. For example, I can make a new directory, Python live, I don't know. And then if I hit dir again, there's now Python live. Um, I can change directory to that. Now I'm inside here, it's obviously empty. Um, I can change to my uh, super directory. I can, in Windows, I think it's rmd. I oh, no, not that one. I can delete, delete it, and I can just um, go around here, and now it's obviously not there, it's not there anymore. Okay. Um, so on Linux, it's um, basically the same, only Linux has some other commands. So the command to list my directories with the ls, and then make dir is the same. And I can even, um, oh, it's already there. So let's delete it. Um, let's make a new one and switch to there. And now I'm inside this directory works pretty much the same as in Windows, just some commands are, other, uh, are different. And yeah. Okay. Um, so like I said, and from like every, all the conda commands I just mentioned are now also accessible from my shell here. So the conda commands we already know are conda activate. So I can act, so first of all I can, First of all, I can um, look at all the environments I have, conda info minus minus env, list me all the directories, and all the conda commands are accessible from here. Um, but let's get to git. So first of all, I make a new directory, make dear something, and then I change directory to this something. Okay, so imagine I'm I want to make a repository for my to-do files now. What I would do is, well, I would make a new to-do file. Like I said, um, the shell can run commands on behalf of me. So for example, I can run the notepad and this opens my Windows notepad. I will edit files in here and start it from the shell such that it's easier for me. So imagine I make a new file called to-do.txt. I open notepad for my to-do.txt and I write some to-do list entry here, for example, by apples. I save it, and then if I um, look at my directory, now there's a new file called to-do.txt, and um, yeah, it's in this directory. So when I want to make a Git uh, repository, 
first of all, I have to run git init such that there is a git repository. So if I now run, like I said, every other command, I run git status, git tells me, well, this is not a git directory. Well, how is it not? Well, because there is no dot git folder here. So obviously it's not a direct, uh, it's not a um, git repository. Uh, I can make it a git repository by running the command git init. And now it told me it initialized an empty git repository here under dot git. So I can look at it. Um, dear, oh God, do you know the command for list all in Windows? I don't know where. So it's a hidden directory dot git. Um, Believe me, it's there. I don't know how to list hidden files in Windows. Um, on Linux, it's simply ls minus a. I don't know what it's on Windows, but believe me, there is now a dot git directory at here. Okay, and if I now run, yeah. Are we going to have a list of these commands? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's the next slide after the, after this uh, presentation. Okay, like I said, if I now run git every other command, I run git status. Git status tells me where there are no commits yet. Um, well, because I just initialized my repository and there's one untracked file called untracked file called to do.txt. Um, I need to add that first. The command for that is git add. And once I add it and I run git status again, <coughs> git tells me now the uh, file has the modifier changed and the next time I commit, it will be committed. So let's do this. Uh, I have to run the command git commit. Then I run minus a minus m, which uh, provides a message. If I wouldn't provide the message here, I would it, op it would open me a text editor, um, which editor it is. It asks you when installing, um, and I have to make some commit message. So commit messages have to be useful. So you make the messages for yourself and for the co for your collaborators. So please make useful commit messages. And in this uh, commit, I for example I write at first to do. So now it tells me it made a new um, commit. I can check if my file, what the state of my files now is. Well, it tells me, well, there's nothing new because I just, all, fi all files in this directory are now unchanged. I can look at my commit by running the, by using the command um, git lock. Oh yeah, I said I'm Leona here uh, on this Windows system because I don't, I didn't want to, uh, I wanted to use it for the homework, so never mind that. And Windows has some problems uh, telling the air, sorry for that. But yeah, it told me now it made a commit. Like I said, it has some hash here as a string. It um, saves the author, which I provided up front, and the date and the message. Okay, so now, yeah. Yes. Sorry. Still bigger? Okay. I actually can't make it any video because then the uh, it's going to be out of bounds because Windows terminal sucks. <laughs> I mean, these commands are the same. Yeah. Okay, so let me do this on Linux. Same commands. Let's do this again. Only that the Notepad in Linux here is called Kate. So let's open my to-do.txt again. Let's write in there. So by apples. Let's look at it. Uh, well, let's first git init. Uh, my terminal here even tells me which branch I want, so it's one for you. Let's git edit. Let's git commit. Um, and yeah. So we see in the log, in the log there's one commit here, I did it again in the so yes. You have to, so all files which are not added um, won't be, um, okay, won't be in the next time. Um, that's what I just said, if you edit, if you edit it, and then you edit it, <laughs> um, if you run simply git commit, it won't um, commit it, but if you run git commit minus a, so git commit all, it's going to it's going to add them too. Um, I will I will demonstrate that right now. So imagine I changed my file here by oranges. So now I changed my to do file here. I say git status. It tells me where the file is now modified. And if I now make git commit, um, 
and I added a second to do. Um, it didn't do anything because this file here is not staged for commit. So if I now run git lock, um, it didn't even make a new one because there are no changes to it. Um, I could manually edit or I simply run git commit minus a minus n. Git commit minus a um, also commits all changed files. So this here was, um, as we saw um, in when running git status, was a changed file. And like I said, git commit only um, commits um, stage files and git commit minus a also um, commits simply change files. So for now on git lock, it will tell me um, where there is a second commit, which the message adds second to do. Okay. Yes. I can also, so if I now, for example, I, I don't know, I went shopping and I actually did buy apples, but I didn't buy oranges. So this is my to-do list now. If I run git status again, I see well it's changed again, it's modified. And to compare it with the version I have, with the newest version of my repository, I can simply um, run git diff, and it will tell me the difference from this file to the version in my, the newest version of my repository. And it tells me, well, I deleted the line by apples. By oranges stayed the same, but I deleted the, the line by apples. And to restore this version, I can simply, um, so I can simply git checkout uh, to do txt. Now I restored the old version, checkout restores the last version in the repository, and if I now look at my todo.txt, um, it will tell me, what? Ah, okay, oh, it was reloaded. I have to reload it, aha. Uh -huh. And it will tell me um, the version I, the last version I committed. Okay. Did that make sense? Do you understand Git now? So, um, this here is um, the easiest cheat sheet I have for you. So we use git init to create new projects or we clone existing projects. Rudiger is going to show that in um, context of the homework. Git status to view which file changed in status. One of the four I presented you, git diff uh, to view each file's differences. And then you can use git checkout to reset files from the last commit or from branches or from other commits than the last ones. Git lock um, views the latest commits. Pull push for GitHub. Rudiger is going to explain that in front of the homework. And we can add and remove and remake the important commit. OK. Okay, um, Rudiger is going to explain the homework in a second, and then afterwards um, you can work on that, while I will probably explain something about the shell. Uh, let me have a uh, few final remarks on Git. So Git is made for source code and is not Roblox. Git is for text-based files, so if you have like videos or something, please don't um, commit them with Git, that's not what Git is for, and Git always wants to look at the difference of files and binary files have, a, un, have an uninterpretable difference. So only add text-based files to give. So we added, for example, the lecture repository also added the PDF. Sometimes you can do that, but normally you shouldn't do that. Um, then there are also git ignores. Git ignores is simply a dot git ignore file in your repository, um, which has file name masks of files you, you don't want git to see. Download the Python one from here, such that you don't add files you don't want to have in there. Yes. Um, modern editors come with Git integration. If you use PyCharm or even Atom and so on, they all have Git integration. Um, but I wouldn't recommend using the Git integration from such an editor before you um, know what Git internally does, because this Git, um, because this Git GUIs also simply run the terminal commands for you, and it's useful to know what these commands are before working with it. Yes, um, there's try.github.io, which is really useful because you can't break anything. Um, you can, it has a, a virtual Git repository, which you can and will tell you what you need to do. So if that was just too fast for you, go to try.github.io. 
it's perfect to learn Git um, in a slow way, and yeah, for Gita looks, for deeper looks, um, look at the Git book. Yeah. Okay, so far, maybe again, any urgent questions right now? Do you feel <coughs> confident about Git? Maybe not, but anyway, <coughs> that's, that's fine because we now do it, going to do it together again. Um, so for the homework, so as we said, there will be one uh, homework each week, and this week we will have the first homework, and we will do it together, so everybody already has the first homework completed, um, hopefully right now, and we will use GitHub to distribute the homework. So, um, did we send uh, this message that uh, you... The should? link is, why I, I sent the message that you have to make a GitHub Yeah, okay. So maybe, who has a GitHub account now? Okay, almost everybody who doesn't have a GitHub account. Okay, then let's see if we have it in here. What you should do then is go to github.com and create a GitHub account there. So uh, <coughs> maybe one word, so um, often when you get more professional in programming or science, like GitHub is often like a portfolio for to show your project. So you probably want to use a username that you can show to others instead of like uh, xx whatever, but <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, that's up to you. Um, yeah. So for those who doesn't have, who do not have a GitHub account, please go there. The others already have one. That's good. So um, <laughs> next up. Yeah, okay, so this basically again explains how the homework is going to uh, be. So um, just you will get a repository uh, on your own. You can pull this to your local machine. Um, you need to make all the tests pass. Uh, you will have a description of like what you are supposed to do. Um, we will also always give you a structure that where we have like basically empty places in the code that you need to fill in. And um, once you are done, you can commit um, at the test pass you can commit and push back to github and then we will have an automatic system that uh, checks again online if your test really passed or did just pass on your local machine and <coughs> if they pass you also pass the homework so but um, yeah this is like the testing system that we are going to use but maybe let's just demonstrate this while we are at it so um, Next up, we have always for every homework, we will have a special link that will direct you to the homework. Um, so this is a GitHub Classroom link. So if you, um, to get access to this link, you need to go to the presentation. There's a tiny.cc slash pfres2 link that you will lead you to this presentation. And then you can also find this link here. And what you then do, well, you click on this link first. And this will redirect you. Classroom, yeah, I am just going to lock out and <coughs> if I have any internet. Now it's PPS 3. <laughs> this should work. And I think.
Okay. So basically, okay. So once you created your GitHub account, you would need to sign in. You will go here. I will do this now. <laughs> Don't say. <laughs> okay. So and then again, it's just like I don't know. So anyway, you would go to the GitHub Classroom link. Then where is it? <coughs> yeah, <coughs> and then you. Ja, aber da bin ich doch angelockt. Das wollte ich ja laden. Ja. Ja. Okay. Let's try again. Okay, so when you go to this um, GitHub Platform Link, you will see, and you're not, uh, not logged in, you will see this page where you need to enter your GitHub credentials. Yes. Okay, so once you successfully entered your credentials, you will be presented with a link, uh, with a list like that. So. And we prepared basically a classroom for you where everybody of you is in with uh, their uh, set login, uh, set login. And okay. what you need to do now is find yourself in this list. So my set login is at set login is Erbusche. So um, here I am. I find my name. Uh, Tiny.cc slash keypress 3 leads to the presentation, and then in the presentation it's a link. We will make a notification in the um, Stodapi class. Yeah. Okay, so who managed to get to the classroom link yet? Okay, good, great. Yes. Sorry. Okay. When when did you sign into the class? That could be the problem. Yeah. <laughs> so um, if your asset login does not show up in this list, then it is because you entered the StartIP um, uh, yeah, the, the start IP class only like uh, this week. We created the list like I think like on Sunday or something. So if you don't find yourself, please write us an email and we can add you manually. But right now it will not be possible then to do the assignment, right? Okay. So. Well, it's now a start IP yeah. um, notification. If you go to the start IP class, you should be able to find the Ankündigung. <coughs> okay, so who was able to find themselves in the list of the asset logins? Also, quite a few, great. Okay, yeah? Can you put up the thing again? We know how to go to the start IP class and. Um, yeah. The not just the last Ankündigung. Yeah, or you type in this link and this will lead you to the presentation that we are showing. Okay, so once you found yourself 
in the list, you click accept assignment. So what will happen now is um, a repository for, or a personal repository for you will be created on GitHub for your homework. So we have some status code, and now we're basically copying the status code to your personal repository. So and then it says, okay, here, great, you're ready to go. The assignments are created here, and here's a link to your personal repository. Go here, and there it is. So it should say 2019, dash homework one, dash your GitHub account name. And it's also a private repository, so yeah, no one else can see it except for you and us. So, <laughs> it's almost private. <laughs> it's the most privacy you get <laughs> in this class. Okay, so next what happened, well, what you now want to do is to actually add some code to make the homework pass. So, to do this, you go here, this green button, clone or download. And what you want to do is you want to clone, and right now that's just using HTTPS. So later on there might also be, or you can also use the option to use SSH. That's easier, but for now we just use HTTPS. Um, and then, you shall, uh, so now you would open your personal shell. Great. <laughs> okay. And you are in your base environment. Okay. And then, yeah, you would maybe you already have a folder to store the files of this class. If you don't have one, you can create one. Um, I should put this down here. So you can go here and then you can you want to clone the repository to your local machine now. So the command for that is use git clone and then the URL that you copied from GitHub. So in the shell to paste you have to press uh, uh, you have to press control shift V, not just uh, control V. This doesn't work and then you hit enter and then you say okay, it's now cloning there. Okay, then again you will need to enter your username and your password to identify yourself against GitHub that you're actually allowed to clone this repository. So you type here <coughs> your credentials. So when you type this in successfully, you will now see that you have a folder here that is, has the same name as the GitHub repository. So you go in there. And here are all the files that are required for your homework. Okay. So just to see where you are, so who managed to um, accept the assignment on GitHub Classroom? Also still quite a few. Okay, who managed to clone the repository to their local machine? Not so many yet, but are still working on it. So I'll give you a few more seconds to do this. Okay. So there's, there's a link on accepting assignment that says like your personal repository was created at this link, right? And you click there, and then you should um, be directed to your repository. What you alternatively can do, just click here, um, just click the GitHub icon, and here are all, I don't know what is happening on your GitHub account, and then you can search here for repositories, and search for homework. Okay, and I happen to have a lot of them, so I don't find it this way. But if you type homework here and you only have one repository, you should be able to find it, right? Or also type like 2019, there's in fact only one. That's mine, you can click here and then you are at the page um, of your personal repository and then you click clone or download and copy the link here.
Yes. Um, but but like these green bars where loading and stuff. At which beginning? Sorry. Okay. Okay. Were more people able to clone the repository to their local machine? Okay. Then we just continue from there. So. Um, as we said, when you work on your homework or do anything in Python, you always want to activate your environment for the project. So, um, for this project, we have the environment scientific programming. Please activate it. And we can also make this a bit larger here. So, and then you can from there, you can start Jupyter Lab and look at the stuff. So. Okay, so you see here that we have a readme file. Um, if you want to see the readme file in a pretty version, you can also right click here, say open with markdown preview, and then you will get the pretty version here. And here basically are again the installation instruction. Hmm? <laughs> and um, yeah, so we already covered all of this. And <coughs> Yeah, to basically tell us what to do now. So it says that first we should run PyTest. Okay, so as we said, we want to do everything um, all we can in Jupyter Lab. So we're also going to use Jupyter Lab from here. So we to run PyTest, we need a new terminal. So we go here to plus have a new launcher and then you open up a new terminal. So here again, when you open a new terminal, you are again in the base environment, so again you need to activate your environment. Okay, and from there you can run PyTest. Can you, yeah. Okay, so what does this tell us? Um, they said we, there are automated tests in your uh, homework repository and by default these tests will fail because it's your task to make them pass. So this says here, okay, there is a f uh, there's a test, test say hello, and this did not um, work because an exception called not implemented error was raised. So what you will do now is we go to the, there's actually just, um, so there are two files in your, um, or two Python files in your repository. One is called hello world.py, um, and here is like we will talk about the details next week, but for now just say this is a function and this function raises an error. And then the program when invoked will call this function. So uh, you can see that uh, if you call a function that raises an error, you will just get an error. Then there's a test file that's separate from um, yeah, the other file. And this basically describes uh, the intended behavior of the program. So. There's a function called test say hello, and there are a bunch of assert statements, and all of these assert statements basically describe what you or what the program is expected to do. So at first we assert that hello world, the module hello world actually has an attribute that's called say hello, so that the function is in there and we did not advertently delete it. And then next we um, try to run the program and capture the printed output from the program. And in the end, we assert that uh, whatever was printed is hello world and then backslash n, which means it's a line break. So to make this happen, we need to print something in this program here. Yes? <laughs> so, um, so instead of raising an error, what we are going to do is we say I want to say print. Hello world. And we're going to hit control S to save um, the file. So this often happens in Jupyter Lab, like when you enter, uh, when you edit the file, you will see this um, round box here. This means that the file is not saved right now. So we need to hit control S to save it. So then we can go back to our terminal that we still have here in our other tab and run PyTest again. And now we will see, okay, one test passed in 
And yeah, we're basically done with this homework right now. Um, to open the terminal, you go here to plus, new launcher, and there you can scroll down and there are things that you can launch and in the, so below the things you can launch, there's also a terminal. You click here and yeah. Ja, okay, das ja, okay. Okay, so we managed to edit the file and uh, pass the test. One. Okay, very few people, so what, what are the issues? Maybe? Yeah. Uh, whenever I try to run Jupyter, it just says fail to create process and then... Do you run Jupyter or Jupyter Lab? Yeah, Jupyter Lab. Okay. Well, okay, uh, I uh, also have a problem with the uh, uh, with creating the environment, so maybe. Yeah. Okay. Then we will have a look at this later. Or yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> what you can do then? So once you made your test test pass, you now want to add um, the stuff to your remote GitHub repository, so we can see that you actually passed your test. So you run git status, right? You see, okay, that you modified one file. You add this file. How do I run a program? Python and then name the program. Just like Java, just Python. Yeah. Java. And I mean, then you run it, and then it will print okay. this other world. If you want to test, if it like, if you want to um, have this testing session where you have to run PyTest. Yeah, you just type like PyTest in the terminal here. Okay. And then it runs. So what PyTest does, it, it looks is it looks for all Python files called test underscore something. And then inside these test underscore something Python files, it's going to run all functions which are named test underscore something and run them. And which in our case, we run this test hello world and the function test hello, yeah, I'll just test say hello in there. And then it will check all if all the asserts are right or not. And if all the asserts are correct, then it will give you a green message. And if not, it will give you a red message. Yeah. Okay, so now we edit uh, our file. Now we want to commit the file. Um, oh God, there's no more. Um, so uh, if you don't uh, put minus m be be, uh, behind git commit, an editor will open up in your shell where you can type your commit message. So there are basically two ways of making commit messages for longer commit messages. It's usually good to open up this editor. So I'm just going to show it right now and hope that it works. Um, so we say, okay, uh, make tests pass. So, so, yeah, so now the thing was committed and we can see, so now we can push to GitHub, we type git push. We again have to enter our username. So now the changes that we made are should show up on our remote um, thing. So where is maybe fashion Yeah. So here we before we had eight commits, now if we refresh the page, we will see that we have now nine commits. And we see that here in the commit it says make test pass. So this is what we just added here. So what you now will also see is that there's a yellow dot besides your commit. Um, so if you go there, you will see some checks haven't been completed yet. So, and then go for details. And here you can basically see uh, the automated system that will grade your homework. So we use a system called Travis CI. So CI stands for continuous integration. It is usually used for software testing where you want to check after every commit that all your tests uh, pass and your program still works as intended and you didn't add a new function that breaks everything else. So we use it or we abuse it a bit for correcting your homework. So um, you can see here um, that uh, yellow means the job is still running 
And if you go to view more details on Travis CI, you can also see in detail what is happening on the Travis CI server. Or you can maybe you also can't because you're not only logged in. Queue, it's not working yet. Yeah. But here you also need to sign in to Travis CI. You can use your GitHub account there. And there you will see, okay, um, it's kind of working, it's not yet starting. It's, it's in the queue because you just yeah. all cloned the repository and first of all ah, it okay. um, checks all the initial um, commits of the repositories, which is obviously failing because it's a task without a solution. <coughs> and once those all went through, your task mm. are eventually going to become. Yeah. Yeah, so as an educational organization, we are restricted, I think, like to a few machines on Travis to a one machine on Travis CI yeah, that you can use for free. So sometimes like when you all start, it takes a while, but... Um, Eventually there's gonna yeah. be the green mark, which means yeah. you pass this on mark. Yes, and you can also like then see basically the code or the console output that run on the Travis CI server. If it worked on your machine, but didn't work on Travis CI, you could, should check here and find out what's actually going wrong. 99% yeah. of the Usually it shouldn't, <laughs> but can still happen. Okay. Um, so first you, you have to push your commit to GitHub, right, to your GitHub account. Then you go here, if you're on the code, you go to commits. And there you see your commit, or besides your commit, you see these marks. So here this commit failed, but this commit is still running. You press the yellow dot here, you go to details. You see like more details about your job on Travis CI, and then you can go the below here, you can go to view details on Travis CI. And there you see the sign in again. You can see what is happening on the Travis CI server. Okay, so that would be basically the workflow for submitting your homework um, in this course. So I guess now we will have time to um, attend to the specific problems that you are facing if this didn't work for you yet. Yeah. So just raise your hand if you are still having Okay, so first of all, um, one, one thing before that. So we have what we just showed you, we also have in the slides. So um, the slides are pretty detailed on that, I hope. Um, so every single step from, from cloning it, like, like if you accept the assignment, and then blah, 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 and then you know you have to press this button, and then this is the commands you have to enter. So try to help yourself by um, using the slides. Um, yeah, oh yeah, first deadline for the new homework is next Tuesday at 12 o'clock. So the deadlines are always going to be Tuesday at 12 o'clock. And the deadlines are hard because we have an automated system testing the file. So if you submit something at 12.01, it's not going to be graded and we're not going to count it. Like it's an automated system and it just stops accepting your homework. There's nothing we can do about it ourselves. Um, yeah, so like I said, this is the entirety of the process of going through it, um, including where you open the files and where you open the terminal. So go through this and you will see um, how it's supposed to look. And if it looks different for you, we are going to go to you now. Can I get push like at 11.59? This will not work. So, so what we actually count is like the state on Travis CI. So once you see a green mark, besides your commit, your pass before that not so you should consider pushing your homework a few minutes before the final deadline so, because but everybody's how much it. time maximum it will take to check the homework um, so usually checking the homework does not take so much time it might be the case like now when everybody just cloned that all the jobs are queued and so that it takes some time so if everybody's pushing in the last minute it will probably also take but a bit but that doesn't even matter and um, you can't push after 12 no, I mean so if the if the checks take until I don't know six in the evening to to run, that doesn't matter. You just can't push after twelve anymore. Okay, but but so are, so are we still counting the results on Travis CI that came yeah, in after? Like, like, ah, like uh, if, yeah, if, I if you can I push, would do it because yeah, okay. if you just the hard deadline is ah, okay. pushing and not how long the test. Yeah, will okay, take. then it's actually fine. So you can push like in the last minute, but then you have to hope that it actually works on Travis CI. If then yeah. there is an error on Travis CI, there's yeah, nothing you can so do about it. So in the best case, you finish bit earlier. <laughs> okay, so then let's get down to it. <laughs>